Hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's late in the evening for me, so almost uh, close to my bedtime. Uh, but I want to thank John for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work with elephants. As many of you know, nothing makes me happier than talking about elephants, and I could literally talk about them all day. With that said, I know I was uh, just supposed to talk about my 20-year journey with elephants in Asia, which I promised to do, but as I was putting this talk together, it was clear that I couldn't really tease apart very easily the work in Asia from what we had been doing earlier in the United States. And so I hope you see as I go through this um, that those two sets of activities are inextricably linked. So for the past 35 years, my goal has always been to study the basic biology of elephants, which we knew very little bit about uh, back in the 80s. So we could use that information to improve reproduction and optimize health and welfare. But my work with elephants hasn't been entirely linear because I essentially have had two parallel careers, one in the US and the other in Thailand, generally offset by anywhere from two to 10 years. And lately, more often than not, the studies I do in the United States are now geared towards trying to determine, well, what can I learn or what new techniques can we develop that would be beneficial and useful and could be transferred to Thailand. But before I get started, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my background because my career path wasn't exactly linear either. I didn't start out to be a wildlife bi biologist or an elephant expert, but rather I was an animal science major focusing on reproduction in domestic livestock species, dairy cattle in particular. So for my master's, I looked at nutritional factors affecting semen quality in dairy bulls. Then I worked in a nutrition lab for about a year, and then finally I was talked into getting a PhD and joined an endocrinology lab there to work on cystic ovarian disease in dairy cattle, where I learned a variety of endocrine techniques and became essentially hooked on hormones. When I graduated, I moved out east to work as a postdoc and then was later promoted to assistant professor at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, the government military medical school. There I looked at a variety of hormonal mechanisms associated re with reproduction, like those shown in the figures here, in both males and females, animal model species. And can I just say the goats were by far my favorites. They were so much fun to work with. But then, as luck would have it, the National Zoo was only a few miles down the road, and so long story short, they learned I was an endocrinologist and that I did have an interest in wildlife. And so I had the great fortune to work with three of the best wildlife researchers in the world. They were called the Three Amigos. Mitch Bush was a wildlife vet, Dave Wilt was a reproductive physiologist, both at the zoo, and Steve O'Brien was a geneticist at the National Cancer Institute not too far away from the zoo. So we worked on a variety of studies together looking at pituitary gonadal function <clears throat> in various cat species to start with because that was kind of that cats were kind of their, their favorite, um, which then used my comparative experience in developing assays for a variety of domestic species. But then once I got a chance, but then I got a chance to travel overseas and I got a passport for the first time to do some field studies in Kruger National Park. Um, because the team had only worked with blood samples, we uh, designed studies to anesthetize Cape Buffalo and Impala, and we bled them every five minutes for two to four hours to assess pituitary testicular function in conjunction with assessing semen quality over two consecutive years during both the breeding and non-breeding season. And let me just say, this was so amazing. And I knew straight away that I would probably never be able to go back to just working with domestic animals again. But what really did it was a study we did on bull elephants where we anesthetized them and then treated them with various GnRH analogs to see if we could suppress testosterone as a means of controlling must. That was the precursor to later studies of GnRH vaccines, which we now know are quite effective in suppressing must symptoms in elephants. But then when I got home, the final epiphany came when I was asked by the elephant manager of the National Zoo if I could measure hormones in females and determine if one of their females was cycling. So Shanti was 12 years old, and we really didn't know when elephants reached puberty. So, of course, I said yes, 
and then began figuring out how to measure progesterone in uh, serum to assess ovarian cycles. Uh, it turns out the concentrations are actually quite low in elephants, so it took a while to find a sensitive enough assay. We then monitored her for a year and a half uh, with twice weekly blood samples, and she was, in fact, cycling. So uh, looking at these um, dark circles, uh, you can see how nicely she was cycling. So she was then sent up to New York for breeding, and we then decided to monitor, monitor her pregnancy as well. And so we published that. And then I wanted to know how long it was going to take her to start cycling again after she gave birth so she could be bred again. And honestly, by that time, I was hooked, and I decided we needed to monitor all of the elephants and to hopefully uh, never stop. So just as an example, this is Shanti monitored for over 20 years um, with first her natural pregnancy and then later on we, we did one by artificial insemination. Um, you might wonder what the cartoon of an elephant uh, on a bicycle is for. Well, you can thank John Roberts for that because he mentioned something on Facebook a while back that every time he heard me talking about elephants cycling, he thought of them riding a bicycle. So now, every time I say it, I think of that too. So, yeah, thanks, John. Anyway, all of that hard work paid off, and in 1991, I was hired as an endocrinologist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, which is the research unit of the National Zoo, uh, and I was asked to develop an endocrine research program. So I worked a lot with felids at the beginning um, because that's what my mentor wanted me to do, but also elephants, which by that time I was now hooked on. So because we had started working with a lot of other zoos in the United States that also wanted to monitor their own elephants, uh, it resulted in us establishing the first wildlife endocrine lab uh, in the diagnostic lab in the country. And over the years, um, that hard work has paid off with significant increases in reproductive rates over the decades because zoos are now better able to track cycles and uh, better time breeding. So we published a lot of th those data early on, and then we started getting requests from students and visiting scientists from other universities and conservation organizations who wanted to learn our techniques. Um, and by this time, we were doing more than just blood hormone monitoring. We had developed techniques to measure hormones in feces, urine, saliva, hair, and feathers. And no one else was really training the, these techniques for the next generation back then. So we started to offer training and internship opportunities. So this um, gal in the top uh, left-hand side with the red hair, that's actually my daughter doing an internship. And down below, you'll note Dr. M working with uh, Katie Edwards way back when. So we partnered with other universities and conservation organizations, and with all of this combined, um, today we have endocrine data on more than 150 species, so we are a truly comparative lab. So, um, but now to show you a bit of what we learned in the early days, and it was really exciting for a young scientist like me back then because near, nearly everything we learned was new. And so here's just a short elephant biology overview. So they cycle between 14 and 16 weeks. So this is the longest of any mammal, and it means that they're only fertile for three to four times a year. They have a nearly two year uh, gestation and then it takes them on average about a year before they start cycling again and could potentially get pregnant. Overall, elephants have a four to six year interbirth interval, so they're not really reproducing all that much throughout their lifetime. One of the interesting things that we found was that elephants in captivity seem to reach puberty um, at a younger age, between four and eight years, compared to maybe eight to 12 years uh, in the wild. But one of the things that we started to see in our service lab was that there were a lot of elephants um, that were not cycling. We call them flatliners, because if they, and if they don't cycle, they can't conceive. So about 20% of the Asians don't cycle normally, but those are mostly the older post-reproductive females, so we weren't too terribly worried about them. But for Africans, flatlining occurred in all age groups, so that was a major threat to population sustainability, and it was really something that we weren't expecting to see. 
So in the mid-90s or so, I sort of went down a rabbit hole for 15 years trying to figure out what was wrong, relying on my animal sciences background to kind of throw the kitchen sink at the problem to try to figure out if there were issues with the hypothalamus, pituitary, gonads, or, or some other endocrine mechanism. And in the end, we really didn't find any clear physiological reason for the high rates of acyclicity other than some hormones um, just didn't have normal patterns. Um, but what caused that uh, was something we, we just didn't know. So that's when we finally started thinking that it might be bigger than just endocrinology and that we might need to take a more holistic approach to see if acyclicity or some kind of reproductive suppression might be related to management or linked to uh, welfare factors. And that led us to our next rabbit hole, uh, trying to determine if there were links between reproduction and management with the idea being that if we could identify management conditions that support good welfare, maybe that would have a positive effect on ovarian function and reproduction. But how do you measure welfare? So that's kind of the $64,000 question. Um, it's not easy, and there's no one single test that we can do to determine if an animal is happy or not, or has good welfare or not. Rather, we need to look at welfare in a more holistic way and to take into account how well we are meeting the physical or physiological needs of the animal through just providing good care, uh, but also, especially for intelligent social animals like elephants, we need to know if we're meeting their psychological needs as well, which is needed for good welfare. So how do we do that? Well, one way is to conduct multi-institutional, multidisciplinary, epidemiological-type studies. And so back in 2010, a group of us got a million-dollar grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to study how factors in the captive environment, these are input variables that are shown in circles, uh, affected welfare outcomes shown in the squares of nearly every elephant in our accredited zoos in North America. So this was the largest welfare study of its kind at the time. And my lab was responsible for all of the endocrine analyses. So we ended up with over 6,000 blood and 6,000 fecal samples that were each evaluated for up to 12 hormones. Luckily, I hired the best technician ever, Steve Paris, who some of you know, and thankfully he is still with me. We didn't break him. Uh, so anyway, we took all the data and did some complicated statistical modeling that I don't understand to see what uh, impact factors uh, impacted welfare outcomes. So this study ended up with at least 19 publications, but I'll spare you and only report the work that we did um, looking at reproduction. So not surprising, for a social species, there were a number of social factors that were um, associated with whether a female would cycle normally or not, and that included being in a mixed-sex herd, so having males and females together, that seems fairly intuitive, uh, but also having high social experiences, so females that were sort of integrated into larger herds where she was interacting with a lot of other elephants had a positive uh, effect on her reproductive function. Experiencing a pregnancy uh, was also related to whether a female would cycle normally or not. And we sort of call this like a use it or lose it uh, because we know that if, um, you know, to, to breed animals on a regular basis is, is a really good thing to do. And if you wait too long in between pregnancies, then you have a reduced chance that that female is eventually going to get pregnant again. So. You know, our goal is to try to get reproductive animals breeding at a fairly regular basis. But we also saw that social isolation decreased the chance that a female would cycle normally. And in some cases, when there's a social incompatibility, um, females are sometimes kept separate. And even when they were allowed to interact through howdy gates and whatnot, those socially isolated females had a, a lesser chance of being a normal cycling female. So we basically concluded that multi-generational herd structures with calves and bulls and elephants spending more time in socially compatible groups is much better for reproduction and welfare. 
Uh, we also looked at a number of management factors, and in particular, enrichment diversity was associated with um, more ovarian cyclicity. So this was offering enrichment items, uh, many enrichment items, multiple times a day, not doing the same one you know, every day, um, kind of mixing it up. Uh, and then the other thing was feeding diversity, so not throwing a bunch of hay in front of an elephant, but uh, feeding it in different ways, hiding it, different kinds of food, you know, kind of making the elephants work to find their food and eat their food uh, was good for ovarian cyclicity. So we concluded that promoting normal behaviors may enhance physiological function. And then even before the IMLS study, my student Carrie Moorfeld and I had been worried about the high rates of obesity in zoo elephants and possible links to poor reproduction, which was based on studies in other species. Uh, so for the IMLS study, we focused on that quite a bit, and over three quarters of the elephants in that study were either overweight or obese. And at least in African elephants, that appeared to be associated with problems with ovarian cyclicity. So then we also developed <clears throat> methods to look at metabolic function associated with obesity, including things like glucose and looking at the glucose to insulin ratio, which in women, lower values are associated with a higher degree of insulin resistance or diabetes risk. We don't really think elephants get diabetes per se, but this is definitely associated with obesity. Lower, lower G to I ratios are associated with obesity. We looked at leptin, which is a hormone produced by fat cells, and not surprisingly, higher values were associated with obesity, but interestingly, high leptin was also associated with ovarian acyclicity. And then, um, our modeling showed that increasing the feeding diversity and exercise, again, making elephants look for their food, resulted in normal body condition <clears throat> and better metabolic function. Uh, we looked at fecal glucocorticoids, and we found that being um, time alone, remember that was also associated with ovarian acyclicity. Uh, poor joint health, which was also associated with the time on hard surfaces, was also associated with higher quote-unquote stress levels, uh, low enrichment diversity also, whereas positive keeper contact uh, was associated with lower glucocorticoids, as was elephants getting a lot of exercise. But now the interesting thing is, and this is where we can't say that high glucocorticoids means bad stress and low glucocorticoids means good welfare. Um, here's a case where the presence of calves was associated with increased glucocorticoids. So it's simply a, an indicator of stimulation, and I imagine anybody out there uh, who have had kids knows that they can be very stimulating and potentially increases your, your cortisol levels, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But overall, what we found was that it wasn't so much the total amount of space that was important, but how enriched the space was, and that it's more important to have a complex environment with socialized elephants. And our hypothesis was correct in that many of the factors important for good welfare in general were also important for normal reproductive function. So that finally brings us to Asia, where I hope you will see as we go along that the challenges facing captive zoo elephants are all, not all that different from those faced by tourist elephants. So now we need to flash back 20 years when I first went to Thailand in 2001 and then again in 2002 where we were conducting studies on bull uh, elephant semen freezing at Mesa Elephant Camp. With the, I was there with the Berlin boys, uh, Thomas uh, Hildebrandt and Frank Goritz, who I think a lot of you know. And it was then that I started to learn more about some of the issues faced by captive elephant populations in, in Asia and how similar they seemed to be to the challenges we were facing in the U.S. So um, I was a little surprised to find out that a third of all Asian elephants um, are managed by humans. They are kept under human care in captivity and used in a variety of ways, kind of depending upon the country but that most of these populations, at least back in the, you know, 20 years ago when I was there, 
they were not self-sustaining populations. Um, you know, maybe Pinoella in Sri Lanka, um, you know, had had decent breeding, but most of the most of the tourist camps in Thailand actually were not doing very well. So, um, in the second trip that I took, so that would would have been 2002, I met with Chacho Thitaram for the first time, and his dean, Dr. Suvachai. And they approached me and said they were interested in establishing an endocrinology lab at Chiang Mai and that they were very interested in doing some uh, female reproduction studies. So we did a training workshop in 2003 and we just kind of continued to work together after that, conducting similar studies of elephant biology. And again, we sort of started out focusing on reproduction, but as the years went on, we got more and more into, you know, more holistic studies looking at at welfare as well. And so there's little doubt that Thailand is the epicenter of elephant tourism uh, and the animals are used in a variety of ways. And the question then is how do these activities uh, actually affect their welfare? And so there are a number of groups that would say that all these activities are bad for elephant welfare. And so tourism has come under increased scrutiny with reports in the media about how tourists should avoid camps that allow riding or shows uh, without having any scientific evidence to support it. You know, it's kind of cancel culture without any real evidence. So uh, we decided to study, and more, study it in more detail to determine, you know, what activities are actually good or potentially harmful to, to elephants. And so we conducted our own epidemiological study in Thailand, which was coordinated by Dr. Bick and our former uh, PhD student, Jadawan, and included training of two new PhD students, so Pakanut, I think a lot of you know Dr. M, and Tree Pradab, uh, Dr. Best, you know, did a lot of the nutritional work. So it was um, fun sort of co-advising all these people. And so this study involved 33 camps in three provinces in northern Thailand with more than 600 elephants. There were direct camp observations and written questionnaires to gather information on camp management, the kinds of tourist activities, the workloads the elephants had, how they were housed, their health care, and the use of various tools to control them. And then we collected welfare measures that were very similar to what we had done in the United States. So body condition scores, we did health assessments looking at wound and foot scores, we measured metabolic markers, uh, lipid panels, and then collected fecal samples for glucocorticoid analyses as a proxy for stress. And then those were all uh, modeled. And the goal was to use a similar epidemiological approach to what we did in the U.S. and model the welfare measures, uh, which are now shown in yellow and blue, against the camp survey input data, which are shown in pink. And so the kinds of activities that we saw across these 33 camps, all of them allowed tourists to feed elephants. Most of them allowed tourists to bathe elephants. Uh, a number of them were involved in riding either with or without a saddle. Walking with elephants was popular. Um, some just let you observe a bath. Uh, not so many were still um, doing shows, and we only had one camp that was a kind of a hands-off, free-move uh, camp. But what we found when we modeled this against uh, some of our welfare indicators was that we found that, but that feeding bananas and sugar cane had some, had some problems uh, and that it was associated with high body condition scores. So about 60% of our elephants were scored as either overweight or obese and that was associated with poor metabolic uh, function and health. And so for an example, we also looked at the data in terms of high and low tourist seasons and you can see higher insulin during the high season, which is likely related to more tourists feeding sweet treats, uh, which is probably not good. Uh, the elephants worked on average about six and a half hours per day, mostly giving rides. And where while there might be criticisms about riding, if it's done right, we found that it could actually be good for physical and physiological health in that riding elephants 
uh, had better body condition and metabolic health. However, if camps don't want to offer rides, which, which is fine, uh, but they must stop allowing tourists to feed a lot of high calorie treats. So there has to be a trade off between diet and exercise in order for elephants to be healthy. Uh, to further address criticisms that riding elephants is harmful, and a lot of people say elephants are not designed to carry uh, heavy weights, uh, we worked with a specialist in the Department of Physical Therapy at Chiang Mai, uh, Dr. Serafan, who um, did a study of gait kinematics with us. So she looked at maximal angles of fore and hind limb joints using a three-dimensional inertial measurement system with wireless sensors. When the elephants walked a short distance, which was basically the length of a large field at Mesa Camp, with only a mahout riding on the neck, and then again with a saddle and two men, plus additional weights to make it 15% of the elephant's body weight, which actually is way more than what a normal riding elephant would probably have to carry. But what we found was that there were no significant effects of weight carriage on those gait parameters. And you can see in the thermal image, the only hot spot was where the saddle was. So this is just a preliminary study, and we need more data on elephants uh, walking for longer periods of time and over variable terrain. But these initial results um, suggest that elephants do appear capable of carrying significant amounts of weight without showing um, too many signs of physical distress. Uh, in terms of elephant control, the vast majority of camps use a hook, working with elephants in free contact. Uh, which is a tool that, if used correctly, um, just ensures the safety of mahouts and elephants in cases of emergency. Uh, but hooks are often overused, and in this study, uh, wounds were found in 27% of elephants whose mahouts carried an ancus, and these wounds were associated with higher um, stress hormone concentrations. So controlling overuse of this tool is essential uh, for better welfare. Only one camp had enclosures for elephants, so nearly all were all the elephants in these camps were chained when the mahout wasn't around and again at night, um, which sadly seems to be most of the time. Uh, the question now is how long is too long to keep an elephant chained? In this study, uh, about 88% of the camps chained the elephants for an average of 16 hours. And there was an association between chaining duration and expression of stereotypic behavior. But it was also associated with low, lower glucocorticoids, um, which indicates that these stereotypies might be serving as a coping or self-soothing mechanism. You know, animals uh, stereotype under conditions that are caused by boredom, frustration, anxiety anticipation or fear, and so regardless of whether they are temporarily soothing, stereotypies indicate poor welfare, and all efforts should be made to mitigate the conditions that cause them. So for example, don't chain elephants um, all day long, and um, it's better to allow them more free time to roam, forage, and socially interact. Elephants are housed in a variety of ways, either together or separate, and they're um, very often chained. Interestingly, we saw the highest concentrations of glucocorticoids when elephants were kept together in sheds. We don't know exactly why this is, uh, but it could be related to elephants being chained in close proximity to unfamiliar or perceived antagonistic elephants, or maybe not being able to reach bonded cohorts because the chains are too short. So we need to do more work on this to tease it apart and figure out, you know, really what is the best way to house elephants long term. So overall, a lot of the factors important to tourist elephant welfare are similar to those for elephants in the States. Uh, it's important for them to have free roaming or foraging time and a good balance between diet and exercise. Proper vet care is critical, as is limiting the overuse of tools, such as chains and the hook. Uh, the other three factors we haven't really studied in much detail yet, but these seem to be uh, maybe the next logical sets of studies to do. For example, if we could put some science behind the importance of using positive training techniques, that might go a long way to gaining acceptance. 
Uh, in the U.S., we found good keeper interactions, lowered elephant cortisol levels. So it would be interesting to see if there might be similar effects with mahouts that have good relationships with their elephants. And the importance of social bonding and interactions, um, it's so intuitive, but it would still be good to have some science to uh, make sure or to make that point and convince camps how really important it is for elephants to socialize, including for the bulls. And so all of these data, you know, have been published. Uh, the one thing I would say about working with Thai students that's really great is that <clears throat> they actually have to publish their work in order to graduate. <clears throat> so master's students publish one to two papers and PhD students publish anywhere from three to five. So this group has been really, really um, productive. So after doing all that work, the next step is to turn the science into action which the Chiang Mai vets are, are doing a really good job of. Um, they regularly visit camps and they've been informing them of the results and ways that they might um, improve their management. I was very happy to hear, for example, that some of the camps were having tourists feed fodder instead of bananas and sugar cane because of the study results on obesity. And to me, that was a major step in the right direction. So these grassroots efforts and working with the camp owners are, I think, really important and, and could potentially be paying off. And that's important because <laughs> there are essentially no enforceable elephant welfare guidelines. In Thailand, there are a couple of organizations that manage registration. Uh, microchipping and also do annual health exams, but in terms of actual welfare guidelines and um, enforcing camps to do the right thing for elephants, um, that's non-existent. So um, as we were kind of wrapping up these welfare studies, a group of scientists, veterinarians, and managers decided that we should get together and create the uh, Asian Captive Elephant Working Group. Um, and it, it does consist of experts not only in Thailand, but also a number of other Southeast Asian countries as well, um, again, focusing on tourist elephants. And our main goal was to create welfare guidelines to try to promote a high quality of life for, for elephants that are used in the tourist industry and to um, create sustainable populations so that wild capture is no longer necessary. Um, but also that it's important that the elephants are not just used for entertainment, but that they can also serve as ambassadors to educate the public and contribute to, to conservation. So we worked with some travel companies to help them guide tourists to ethical camps sort of based on what our welfare guidelines were, <clears throat> which in our mind could include camps that allowed riding because we did not necessarily find that that in and of itself was bad for welfare. Um, the guidelines were then subsequently endorsed by the IUCN Asian Elephant Specialist Group and then started to be used by the Asian Captive Elephant Standards, which is a company in Thailand that is using those guidelines or some of those guidelines to audit and um, certify camps. Um, I guess not just in Thailand, but other Southeast Asian countries. And so we were making great strides with all of this, and then boom, COVID hit. And in 2020 of April, Thailand um, banned all international travel and all tourism ceased and the camps closed. So we didn't exactly know what to do about this, but being scientists, we thought, well, we maybe better just study it. So we started to design a study to look at how the COVID-19 tourism ban was affecting camp management and then subsequently elephant welfare, um, kind of focusing on the northern Thailand area. And we're in the perfect position to do this because we have had years and years of pre-COVID uh, data to compare it to. And so our graduate student is going to be um, working on uh, gathering data during COVID. Um, she was supposed to be looking at after COVID as well, but it's going on for so long. I have a feeling that her, her um, PhD is only going to be during COVID and we'll have to find maybe somebody else to do the after COVID work. But anyway, our graduate student, I is her name, is going to be doing camp surveys of 30 camps with more than 400 elephants. Um, surveying them every four months, so we're a little bit more than halfway through the study. 
And then there's a subset of seven elephant or seven camps with 60 elephants where we will collect samples to do the physiological and behavioral monitoring um, and then try to compare that to some pre-COVID data. So this table summarizes our survey data to date. Uh, when we did the first survey right after the shutdown, we also asked about conditions in the three months before COVID to use as baselines. So you can see the number of elephants decreased um, actually rather quickly after the camps closed and has sort of remained at that level um, where the mahouts were taking the elephants out for other work or maybe taking them back to the village. We don't really know what happened to all of the all of these elephants. But the m number of mahouts has also decreased as they um, sort of left the field where before there was at least one mahout per elephant. Um, in the last survey that we did um, recently, there was um, one mahout per maybe two elephants. So the, it's pretty clear that elephants aren't necessarily getting the daily care that they probably should have. And the reason for mahouts leaving is not, um, not, not questioned um, in that they're getting a, a much reduced um, salary. So they're looking for other work and, and trying to find a way to make a living. Um, the work activities, the elephants before COVID were involved in riding shows, uh, tourist feeding, but of course now they have no activities and instead most of them are being chained pretty much all day long. Um, the chaining hours, to be perfectly honest, were pretty high <laughs> to begin with at like 16 hours. Um, but it's now even worse. And if you look at the last survey where the, the range is zero to 48 hours, I remember telling I, it's like, well, you can't have 48 hours in a day. And she said, well, it's because the camps are telling us that, they're, that some of these elephants are chained for 48 straight hours before they get a break. So pretty dismal. There was only one camp that never chained its elephants. So that zero is, is, is for one camp. Walking distances are also decreased quite a bit if they're not giving rides, although I think the mahouts are still trying to get them some exercise, although maybe not every day. Um, there's a little bit of an uptick in the amount of uh, distance per day in the last survey, and we think that it might be because the Chiang Mai group is telling the owners and the mahouts how important exercise is, so maybe they're trying to do a little bit better job of, of getting the elephants some exercise, if not every day, then you know maybe every other day. They are still being bathed, but again, it's not necessarily always every day. The one uh, maybe positive thing coming out of this is that supplemental feeding of bananas and sugarcane are down considerably. So a lot of camps just aren't giving them these things at all, which um, I think is going to be really interesting to look in terms of metabolic function and that sort of stuff. And maybe that's not so much a bad thing. So the physiological assessments are basically the same as what we did in the studies before COVID hit. And, but then we also added some additional parameters given that this is likely a once in a lifetime opportunities. So for example, we're looking at stereotypic behavior, especially given how long elephants are being chained now. Um, that study is being led by Dr. M. Uh, we also have decided to do white blood cell counts and to calculate the heterophil to lymphocyte ratio, which has been shown to correlate positively with cortisol and be another potential measure of stress and welfare. Um, and is something that Martin Seltman did uh, recently in Myanmar on elephants there. Uh, we're also interested in looking at oxidative stress and muscle function enzymes because these can be negatively affected by a lack of physical activity. So these are new tests for elephants, and while we don't have any data to show you yet, I think these are going to be really interesting to look at, um, especially once COVID is over and elephants hopefully start returning to normal uh, activities. So keep in mind, we're only partway through the two-year study. I'm going to show you some preliminary data that Dr. I recently put together for me. So for body condition, you can see that it's gradually declining over time <clears throat> during the pandemic. Uh, but before you get too excited, if you look at the scores that we're seeing, even at the very beginning, uh, keep in mind that a three is considered normal and five is very fat. So these were all very fat at the start of the study. 
And although they're lower now, um, they are still considered overweight a year or so out. And for some reason, this population started out even higher than what uh, Dr. Best uh, had done, where the mean was about three and a half. So maybe we're not making that much progress getting camps to reduce high calorie treats as we thought we were, but the decline could also be, um, it, it might be more dramatic if elephants were getting exercise at the same time, which of course they're not. So yeah, we're kind of interested in seeing um, how this goes over the next year. So looking at the lymphocyte to heterophyll ratio, knowing that the ratios go up um, as an indicator of stress, we do see a gradual increase. Uh, the uh, ranges or the, the data for these, um, these data are well within the range that Martin Zeltman had reported in Myanmar. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if this trend continues over the next year. And although the data are quite variable, we are also seeing an upward trend to a little bit in serum cortisol, which agrees with the leukogram data. Uh, we don't have a lot of baseline serum cort in Thai elephants to compare it with, um, but in one study done a few years ago by uh, the technician Yim uh, with only a few elephants, the concentrations are actually much lower than what we're seeing in these elephants today. Um, but because we don't have pre-COVID values on these elephants, um, I hesitate to overinterpret these data, but it suggests that stress levels might in fact be a bit up. But then when we look at fecal glucocorticoid metabolites, it doesn't really follow the other stress marker patterns, which is sort of frustratingly difficult to explain. Uh, the concentrations are in line with earlier studies, however, so it basically remains to be seen um, if they change at all during the COVID lockdown. And then Dr. M just recently published some preliminary data on stereotypies in camp elephants during COVID. Um, as you can see, the highest prevalence is in the adult age groups compared to younger or old, older elephants. Uh, she found 57% displayed stereotypies, which is similar to what was seen in a large welfare study in the UK a few years ago. In our big US welfare study, 84% of the elephants exhibited stereotypies, which sounds awful, although the vast majority stereotyped less than 15% of the day. In that study, elephants were recorded all day and night though, which likely accounts for the overall higher rates compared to the other studies where elephants were really only observed for short periods of time. I think M used 15-minute uh, observation periods for her study. But at 57%, this is a concern, um, especially uh, since stereotypes, uh, stereotypies are linked to chaining and can ultimately have negative effects on the feet and joints. And they can also become an ingrained, they can also become an ingrained behavior. So even when conditions improve, the elephants may still do it. So the final thing I'd like to present are some re results from a, um, a HOOT survey that we conducted to see how they are being impacted by the COVID shutdown. Uh, these data are from the first survey we did right after the camps closed and then again a year later. And so as you can see, a high percentage of Mahouts are feeling stressed or sad um, with not much change over time. And they're also worried about reduced salaries and increasingly um, worried about being laid off, which has happened obviously to a number of them. Some mahouts indicated they might sell their elephants or take them back to the village. The lower percentage after a year suggests that many may have actually done that. Uh, there was interest in planting grass to feed their elephants, although we don't actually know if any of this is happening. Um, in the last survey, about a third reported that they had taken out a loan to live on. And this wasn't something that we saw in the first survey. And nearly everyone is appealing to outside organizations for help. And so a number of organizations have actually um, stepped up, uh, most notably the Thai elephant uh, Alliance Association and the Chiang Mai University Veterinary Group. Uh, the Department of Livestock apparently has provided some camps with grass or other fodder, um, but we're not sure if that's enough. I'm actually part of a fundraising 
effort to raise money for elephant veterinarians and to feed moms with babies. This is with Susan Makoda and the Elephant Care International with Hollis Burbank Hammerland and John Roberts, who is helping coordinate our work on the ground and is making sure funds get to where they are supposed to. Um, we don't uh, see this going away anytime soon, so we are continuing to seek donations. So if anyone is interested in helping, um, please, please do so, and you can certainly contact any of us for information on how to do that. So I would like to end by sort of asking you all whether, whether we should maybe be looking at a paradigm shift in how we manage elephants and tourism. In the United States, as a result of the welfare work, a number of zoos actually got out of elephants because they realized they couldn't meet their welfare needs. But what about elephant camps? You know, perhaps it might not be a bad thing if there was some attrition in the number of camps with only those that are in more rural environments with forests or, um, you know, f with forests for elephants to forage in or that have enough land to grow their own grass. You know, maybe those are the ones that could stay in business. You know, perhaps camps could partner more with local artisans, so even if tourists don't come, they can still sell products online and raise money for the elephants. Um, the idea of virtual tours, I think, is a good one. And although I know John doesn't charge for his, um, perhaps there are ways to monetize these so camps can stay in business during down times. I mean, I think this is an important question to ask because it's very likely that COVID won't be the last pandemic so we need to be better prepared for the next one. And being kind of an internal optimist, I actually am sort of hopeful that we may see some positive change once this crisis is over. Um, and I am kind of looking forward to seeing what might happen next. So I'm going to leave you with that and just um, thank very much all of our sponsors and donors and foundations that have supported our work. Um, these studies can be very expensive and we certainly couldn't do it without a lot of help. And then finally, a big thank you to all my friends and colleagues in the U.S. and in Thailand who have helped make this work possible and especially to my Chiang Mai colleagues. You know, thank you for welcoming me into your world, teaching me about elephants, letting me be a mad scientist sometimes, and really just being the greatest colleagues I could ever hope to work with. Um, I have been truly blessed, and the only thing I wish for now is for COVID to be over so I can return to Thailand and Lao and Myanmar and to just get back to work. So I thank you all very much for, for listening, and um, I think we may have a few uh, minutes for questions. So, yeah, again, thank you so very much for your attention. Thank you.